What is up, ladies and gentlemen? How are you all doing? I'm coming at you from the Pacific Northwest, and today I want to talk about some things, obviously. That's why I'm making a podcast. I want to talk to you about things. So, today on the agenda, we're going to talk about Donald Trump and his position on guns. We are going to talk about... uh. Apparently, assault weapons bans in villages across the U.S. And we're going to talk about how the courts handles police officers and their cases about excessive force. We are also going to talk about what I feel are some important principles of liberty. I might make an individual video talking about that later. As for now, I just want to slightly go over what I feel or principles of liberty. Whether you are a constitutionalist, a libertarian, a republican, a classical liberal, or any sort of faction that can be within the liberty movement, I want to talk to you about what I feel are principles of liberty. So without further ado, let's talk about something that we deserve because we elected Donald Trump. And by we, I mean Republicans. Something we deserve. Well, not just Republicans, also the blue-collar Democrats, the union, the the non-socialist, but at the same time socialist, conservative Democrats, which I call blue-collar Democrats. Basically, in my opinion, if you were to sit a redneck down and sit a blue-collar worker down and have them talk about anything but politics... They would get along very well. That's in my opinion. That's anecdotal. I have no evidence of this. No statistical evidence. I have no empirical data to prove that. But who cares? <clears throat> so, an Illinois town just banned assault weapons. And guess what the penalty is if you keep one? Up to $1,000 a day. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. This is constitutional justice coming down your throat from the candidate that the NRA endorsed. Is it Illinois or Illinois? I always call it Illinois. Illinois? China, Illinois? China, Illinois? Anyway. The village of Deerfield in northern Illinois has passed a ban on assault weapons, but it affects much more than sales and manufacturing. If the 18,000 residents of the Chicago suburb don't forfeit or secure weapons that fall under the ban by June 13th, they will be charged from $200 to $1,000 a day as a penalty. The village wants a sense of, quote, of safety, unquote. According to the ordinance, which the Village Board of Trustees unanimously approved Monday night, it is unlawful for a person to carry, keep, bear, transport, or possess an automatic weapon in the village, except if the weapon is broken down in a non-functioning state, is not immediately accessible to any person, or is unloaded and enclosed in a case firearm carry box, shipping box, or other container by a person who has been issued a currently valid firearms firearm owner's identification card. Law enforcement officers, current and retired, are exempt. So, isn't this just the kicker? We hear constantly from the left about how police officers are tyrants, about how they are racist, about how they target black people. Maybe I'm sort of uh, generalizing here, but, that's, but that is generally the type of rhetoric that we hear, without a doubt. Just go on any Black Lives Matter page, any police brutality page, and that's what you hear. And yet, in an Illinois town, which I would consider a blue-collar a blue collar town, a blue-collar state, a swing state maybe, in Illinois, a liberal haven, if you really think about it, are making police officers exempt from owning, quote, assault weapons, unquote, 
They're the only ones allowed with guns. Now, I know you could say, well, they're not the only ones allowed with guns. Well, we'll go over what a supposed assault weapon is according to this city ordinance in Deerfield. Sorry, village ordinance. The ordinance makes specific reference to a recent mass shootings in Parkland, Florida, Las Vegas, and Sutherland Springs, Texas. So I want to make something very clear. What cracks me up is that they reference Sutherland Springs, Texas. Because the shooter used an AR-15 style rifle. But you know who stopped the shooter? An NRA instructor with an AR-15 style rifle. They don't make mention of that, but yet they're going to ban AR-15 style rifles from law-abiding citizens who have not broken a single law up until this ordinance was passed. They're going to strip those away from law-abiding citizens. When in some cases, like in Sutherland Springs, Texas, it took somebody with an AR-15 style rifle to stop the mass shooting. Let's talk about Parkland, Florida. The officers, which were armed, by the way, which are the only people under this ordinance who are allowed to be armed, stood outside the school and they blamed their training. They're like, oh, well, it's protocol for us to take cover and assess the situation. Okay, that's fine. You hear gunshots, you get behind cover, you figure out what the hell is going on. Once you realize that the shooter is not in your sight or anywhere near you, you chase down the shooter as a police officer. That's what you do. That's your job. But they stayed safely outside while children were getting slaughtered. Now let's talk about Las Vegas. That one was terrible. I don't know if anything could have stopped it. I don't know if armed security at the hotel could have stopped it. I don't know if somebody from the crowd could have shot up at the window with their pistol. I don't know if somebody in a hotel room nearby could have stopped it. I don't know if we should have everything that we bring to a hotel, a hotel searched because this guy brought up bags and bags of guns and ammo. I don't know what to do in that situation. But I tell you what, the Las Vegas shooting, that is a rare occasion. And the, I feel bad for anybody who died in Las Vegas. It's absolutely terrible. It's reprehensible. It should never happen. At all. Anyway, let's continue. Quote, assault weapons, unquote, have been increasingly used in an alarming number of notorious mass shooting incidents at public places, public venues, places of worship, and places of public accommodation. The ordinance reads, The authors of the legislation claim the law may increase the public's sense of safety notwithstanding potential objections regarding the availability of alternative weaponry or the enforceability of such a ban. So therefore, they are going on a motion. They are basing their ordinance on a motion that might make people feel safe despite other weaponry will be available and it won't really be enforceable. But we'll pass the ordinance because it will make people feel safe. That is some shitty logic. CNN has reached out to Deerfield's management analysis for comment. Objections, as you might imagine, have come in, come in spades. On Thursday morning, the Illinois State Rifle Association announced that they and the Second Amendment Foundation had jointly filed a lawsuit against the village of Deerfield. They are blatantly violating state law, and they are violating the Second Amendment, says Richard Pearson, executive director of the Illinois State Rifle Association. He told CNN, the ISRA has been receiving waves of calls from people upset over the ban and is confident the ISRA's legal challenge will prevail. The penalties are just draconian, he says. A guy or a lady who owns a large capacity magazine or any like that could owe thousands of dollars. And if they cross the thin, almost invisible blue line between municipalities, they could be considered a criminal. The NRA is supporting a similar lawsuit 
filed by the gun advocacy group Guns Save Lives. Every law-abiding villager of Deerfield has the right to protect themselves, their homes, and their loved ones with the firearm that best suits their needs. Chris W. Cox, executive director of the NRA's lobbying arm, said in a statement. CNN has reached out to the NRA for further comment. Of course, the term assault weapon is in and of itself highly contentious, and no discussion of such a ban would be complete without some clarification. Since the expiration of the federal assault weapons ban in 2004, there has been there hasn't been any official definition for the term. It is often dismissed by gun rights advocates for its impre imprecision in describing what exactly an assault weapon is or isn't. A common NRA talking point states that an assault weapon should be defined as any weapon used in an assault, whether it be a gun, a knife, or otherwise. Yes, that makes sense. That makes sense. A weapon is just a tool, and I know somebody out there, as soon as I say that, is going to say, well, no, but this tool is meant for killing. Yeah, sure, fine. It's meant for killing. That doesn't mean anybody who owns one is going to kill it. It's also meant for target practice. It's also meant for self-defense. It's meant for hunting. And key word, don't concentrate on the hunting and say you don't need an AR-15 for hunting. Don't say something like, well, you can shoot targets without an AR-15 style weapon. Self-defense. We are already... I know people out there are like, oh, what are you going to do? Shoot a drone with, with a shotgun? <laughs> I hear that argument. I, I will address it a little bit. And I, I might make a more in-depth video about it. But let's talk about that for a second. We are already outnumbered by our government. And don't get me wrong, I am not advocating that we should go shoot our government. That we would stand a chance against our government. I'm not saying that we should do a 1776 revolt at all. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that your firearms, the right to self-preservation, the right to bear arms, the Second Amendment was written so a civil population, the civilian population, can defend themselves from a tyrannical government if they ever needed to. If the occasion ever came, the people would be able to overthrow their government and replace it with one that respects life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness under the protection of rule of law. That's what the Second Amendment was written for. And to address the argument, there's many ways to address the argument, but to very briefly address the argument of, well, the government has drones, we're going to do shoot it with your pistol? So just because we're outnumbered by the government, or we're outgunned by the government, they have much better technology than us, we should just give up all of our guns. You know what the military has? They have fully automatic weapons. You know what the civilian population doesn't have? Any fully automatic weapons made after 1984 without paying a tax and getting a license and a waiting period. Not to mention if you can even afford one if you can find one because they run for almost 2 or 20k. They're rare. Most people don't have them. Most criminals aren't going to buy one because it's so much money. Why? Because they can use anything under the frickin' bus, including a bus, as we see in Europe. I could go on forever about this. It's ridiculous. These people, they don't, they don't understand. Be and that argument to me is, it's so funny because the government has airplanes and drones and bombers and tanks and therefore you should give up your semi-automatic weapons and make that discrepancy even bigger. Are you kidding me? <laughs> the power between the citizens and the government is so huge already, we should make it even bigger. 
that that's in the face of that just slaps logic right in the face but yeah, and it's reasonable. Any weapon used as an assault should be an assault weapon. Otherwise, it's not an assault weapon. A cop, sorry, I already read that part. Deerfield's ordinance sets its own extensive definition of the term. In short, its version of an assault weapon is a semi-automatic rifle that has the capacity to accept a large capacity magazine, detachable or otherwise. By the way, in case you're wondering what large capacity is, that's more than 10, <laughs> generally under these guidelines. There are other aspects, including rifle additions and types of magazines. So basically, any cosmetic addition to a rifle or anything that makes a rifle more comfortable, like a pistol grip, you know, if you if you have your hand under the trigger as opposed to behind the trigger, yeah. That's a that's a big problem <laughs> according to these guys. Cosmetic features that might make the gun more comfortable makes it an assault weapon. Oh god, you have a foregrip on there. <laughs> you better watch out. Oh gosh, you have a detachable hand grip. You better watch out. Oh gosh, you have a folding stock. That increases the rate of fire. As you can tell, I'm a little irritated by this. As defined by the village, the term also includes semi-automatic pistols. So by the way, if you have a 12 plus 1 compact sized 9mm, that's an assault weapon. A concealed handgun for protection is an assault weapon, if it has more than 10 rounds. Semi-automatic shotguns, conversion kits, and any shotgun with a revolving cylinder. Amazing, isn't it? The ban also provides an open-ended list of firearm models. It includes the AR-15 and its variants, which have been used in an overwhelmingly number of highly publicized mass shootings, including February's attack at Majory, uh, Majory Stoneman Douglas High School. So right off the bat, they go into fear-mongering, saying, Oh, this AR-15-style rifle has been used in so many mass shootings. False! Most shootings are done with handguns. And I, I, I get that they're covering handguns. I get that. They are covering handguns. Well, good for them. Now that five foot four woman, that five four foot girl walking down the street at night can easily get raped by a six foot two, two hundred pound man. Congratulations. You're really you're really making the bar equal. For men and women, for w men and women, aren't you? This is ridiculous. <laughs> I am irritated. And you know what? For any Donald Trump voters out there, we you, we deserve this. Th this is what happens when you elect Donald Trump president, who's weak on guns. <clears throat> I I make fun of liberals a lot, but this episode I'm going after conservatives as well. Screw liberals. Not, they're not liberals. Radical leftists. Screw leftists for pushing gun policies that restrict your right to defend yourself. One of the greatest liberties that you have is the right to self-defense. A firearm is one of the greatest equalizers between either... I know some people like to make fun of men saying they have small members downstairs for wanting to own a gun. Fine, go ahead and make fun of them. Some men aren't very tall. Some men aren't very built. Men on men violence is pretty high. That's why smaller guys are sometimes bitches in prison. <laughs> you know what else? The woman, the 130 pound woman, the 110 pound woman, sometimes 170 pound woman is no match for a 5'11", 6'3", man. So a firearm in that case would be one of the greatest equalizers there is. So like I said, we deserve this for elect. I don't deserve this. I didn't vote Donald Trump. So this is where I'm going to criticize conservatives. Or Donald Trump supporters. We knew that Donald Trump was weak on guns. We knew Donald Trump wouldn't do anything. 
and we're letting federal judges make laws. Under the Constitution, the federal judges, the Supreme Court, has no authority to decide what is or what isn't constitutional. They can review, but those activist judges have no power whatsoever. Let's continue on. In January 2000, in his book, The America We Deserve, Trump wrote that Republicans refused even limited restrictions on guns and said they walked the NRA line. Assault weapons ban, he, he praised assault weapons bans and waiting periods. Bravo, this is who we voted. This was 2000. Oh, you're reaching back for 2000. Fine. 2012. December of 2012. Donald Trump tweeted support for Obama's tighter gun restrictions. President Obama spoke for me and every American in his remarks in Newtown, Connecticut. Okay. <laughs> That's 2012. Fast forward to 2015, we get a flip-flop. Of course, when he was about to run for president. Donald Trump claimed he supports the Second Amendment in 2015. Fast forward to March 2016. He told local news news station in Grand Rapids, Michigan, that guns were a state's right. No, they're not a state's rights. They're an individual's rights. States don't have any authority to restrict gun ownership. I know some people out there will say, well, under the Constitution, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but restricting somebody's right to own a firearm is a violation of the Second Amendment. It's a violation of your right to own property. It's a violation of your right to defend your life. It's a violation of individualism. In June 2016, Donald Trump proposed support for banning people on the no-fly list from owning a gun. So let me tell you about the no-fly list. Little girls have been on the no-fly list. There is no due process. They're, you're not taken to court for the no-fly list. You can't fly an airplane from the no-fly list. Little girls and old ladies have been on the no-fly list. So why would we use that as a list to take away people's rights when there's no due process and when their standards are so crappy that a little girl can't fly on an airplane? Also, Donald Trump in 2016 supported stop and frisk for taking guns away in cities like New York where guns were basically all banned. I say basically because you, know, you can un own a gun if you prove that you have a reason to own a gun. And there's very few reasons why you need to own a gun unless you know one of the politicians. Or, of course, the sheriff or the police chiefs. October 2016, we get a another flip-flop. Basically saying that he supported the Second Amendment about a month before election time. And that you shouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton. And in 2017, Donald Trump gave a speech at the National Rifle Association, at the NRA. And then in 2018, <laughs> yeah, uh, we should ban bump stocks. We should raise the age to 21. We deserve this. We knew what we were electing in office. There's no reason to act surprised. Well... Oftentimes, you actually see conservatives forget why they voted for Donald Trump. Forget why they supported the Second Amendment. Because they're such cucks, to use their own language, that they will take it by Donald Trump. They'll forget why they're conservatives. They'll forget why they are constitutionalists. They'll forget why they voted for him. <clears throat> it's unconstitutional. <laughs> So that's that. There's no good segue into what I believe should be the principles of liberty. We're going to go down away from my angry, whiny rant. We're going to take a nice chill pill. And we're just going to talk about, like again, again, like what I said, what are the principles of liberty. There's basically six things that I wrote down to be the principles of liberty. Number one being high beast corpus. Number two being private property. Number three being freedom of speech. Number four being skepticism of authority. 
Number five, being individualism. Number six, being self-defense. And I'll break these down and I will explain them. So for number one, for high beast corpus, if you don't know what that is, it means you ba basically you shall be told what you are being punished for. So before you are arrested, before the government arrests you, they must explain why you are being arrested, restricted, or punished. There needs to be transparency. You need to be told about the law that you are breaking. There needs to be some sort of indication of law. There, it needs to be written somewhere, it needs to be posted somewhere, it needs to be stated. Therefore, you're not punished for something that you didn't know. And in that case, it's your responsibility. I think there should be some leeway because this is overused because I believe, uh, I can't remember, there's a term for it, but basically ignorance of a law doesn't exempt you from the law. I think there should be an exception from that, especially from some things that are so obvious. Uh, murder obviously isn't one of those that I think you should be exempted because you didn't know, but some stupid minor laws I can get you like a thousand dollar fine, there should be in my opinion, some leeway, some grace. So private property, why is private property? Oh yeah, and the reason number one is also so important other than the law need, needing to be stated, the government shouldn't be able to come and grab you. I apply high beast corpus in my opinion, that principle to warrants. A government employee, whether it's a police officer or a federal agent or even a state agent, should not be allowed to just put you in handcuffs, put you in a car, take you to prison or jail or a court without telling you why, without giving you an explanation, without a warning. They need to be 100% transparent. That is my philosophy for Hybis Corpus. That is one thing that is so important that nobody talks about really other than Rand Paul talking about a warrant. Number two, private property. You need to be able to own your own property. So you have a basis to evaluate how you allocate resources. Private property is so important because in my opinion, and some of these will cross over and can be explained by the other ones. That's the beauty of thinking. That's the beauty of language is that sometimes it's circular. But private property, to me, extends, it begins with yourself, your body. Your body is your private property. Nobody else has a right to it. After what I consider to be the cutoff period, 18 years old, you are, you own your own property, your body. That is your property. And I think you know, we can have some distinction between what your parents are allowed to do with your body when you're under the age of 18. I don't think they can force you to go through hormone replacement therapy. I don't think they can force you to wear clothes that you don't want to wear at a certain age. They shouldn't dress you a certain way. And they shouldn't force you to eat stuff you don't like. I think there should be a distinction between that. But at the age of 18, you your, your body is your, priv your, your private property. That is your property. You do with it as you wish. You can get tattoos. I mean, you have to suffer the consequences of your actions. So let me make that clear. But you can get tattoos. You can cut your hair bald if you want. You can do drugs. You can consume anything you want. Everything you do, anything that involves your body, you can do whatever you want so as long as you don't hurt another person. And private property, land ownership, is an extension of your body. Private property is an extension of your labor. Therefore, your private property extends as far as your authority can possibly go. Through legal means under the rule of law. This is why I'm not an anarchist. You need a system of government to enforce private property. Sorry for any anarchist that is listening out there. I'm sympathetic to you, and in principle, I share every value you do. In principle. But there is a bit of pragmatic, uh, pragmatic ide ideologically, I can't talk. There's a bit of pragmatism that goes into my belief. In principle... 
anarcho-capitalism. In practice, and rule of law. So private property to me is an extension of your body, what your body is able to produce, what your labor is able to help you buy, what you are able to accomplish. And therefore, you have a means from your body extending out to property that you own to allocate resources, to base your life on. Your private property is where you should feel safe. It's your sanctuary. That's area that you control. That's why private property is so important to me. Number three, freedom of speech. So I mentioned tattoos under private property. And they are related in some way. Because if you're on your private property, you can do whatever it is you want to on your property. Run around naked on your property. Have orgies on your property. I mean, that's not stuff I like, but go for it, dude. Cons consume substances on your property. You own your property, including your body, so you should be able to express your mind, your ideas, through your property, through your body as you wish. So tattoos falls under both private property and freedom of speech, because tattoos are a way of expressing yourself. And so is private property. Your body is your private property, therefore you can do with it what you want. You have freedom of speech, therefore you can do with your body as you wish and express, express it how you wish. You need to be able to speak your mind and discuss ideas. Jordan Peterson on Channel 4 talking to, oh, what's that one lady's name? I can't remember. Basically, the so what you're saying is woman who's now a meme after that interview on Channel 4 with Jordan Peterson. She asked him, why does your right to freedom of speech trump a transgender person right? To not be offended and Jordan Peterson's great line that I still remember that I will always remember because in order to think you have to risk being offensive and that's beautiful you need to be able to express your ideas that's how we keep authority in check that's how we pursue our interests that's how we pursue relationships that's how we pursue our goals, by expressing ourselves, by saying, by being free in our thought. It allows us to be free as humans. It is part of the human experience. It is so important. Number four is skepticism of authority. You need to be able to challenge and petition authority. It is important to keep monopolies and authority accountable. Which goes back to freedom of speech, uh, habeas corpus, and private property. You know, that's your property. You have these rights that shall not be infringed upon. So you need to be skeptic of authority. Sometimes that can go too far. Sometimes you can think that you're 1776-ing it, but then other people regard you as a terrorist. So that only extends so far, but the reason why you need to have skepticism of authority is because people, especially the government, people in power, they have authority over you in a certain extent. They have monopolies on violence. They have monopolies on control. They're able to do so much and they are given tax money that you pay to have authority over you. That is why you need the freedom of speech to ask for a redress of grievances, to protest your government. That is why you need private property, because you need a sanctuary that says, hey, you're not allowed on my property with that hobby's corpus. You need to tell me what law I broke and how it violates, and most laws, in my opinion, should be based on the non-aggression principle. I don't think the non-aggression principle is perfect, but it's a good start. They should be based on private property and individualism. Your your freedom, your ability to speak your mind. Those that relate to the person, his body, and his extension of his body should be what are what rule of law is based around and protection of that. Therefore, freedom of speech, skepticism of, of authority falls under that. We need to keep anybody with a monopoly, anybody who has control over us, anybody who has a monopoly on violence, we need to keep them accountable. Therefore, skepticism of authority is 100%
a principle of liberty. Number five is individualism. You need to be rationally self-interested in your own well-being. So individualism, basically your private property, your body is what you're worried about. You are under no obligation to put your thoughts, your own property, and your rights and throw them down the drain for somebody else. You live for yourself. You are entitled to your thoughts and your ability to be self-interested in your own means of production. Now I know a lot of people just freak out when they hear that because sometimes what's within your self-interest isn't always good for society and I say bullcrap and I will explain why. Being self-interested is one of the most greatest things that you can have and like I said I will explain why. So without further ado, let's go on to number six and then we can go on to why being self-interested is actually great for society. Number six, self-defense. You need to be able to defend your rights and your life. Number six, self-defense is so important. We kind of touched on it when I was talking about the Second Amendment and assault weapons bans because your right to self-defense protects you as an individual. You as an individual have a right to protect yourself. You have a right to protect your thoughts, your private property. You have a right to protect unjustified force used against you. So, let me explain how these law or how these principles aren't in conflict with society. How rational self-interest, how being self-interested, how being selfish, virtue, selfishness, or selfish virtue, um, rational self, I'm trying to think of the way to phrase it, how would Ayn Rand phrase it, rational self-interest, uh, reasonable selfishness, whatever, selfishness can be a virtue, and I'll explain why, <clears throat> so, we need to operate with an understanding, that you are vulnerable. At any moment, something can harm you. You need to find a way to partake in the system. You need to find a method of interacting with people and the environment while allocating resources and a means of producing and consuming to, pro to prolong your life. And to render the struggles of living in a manner that is desirable. What will be in your self-interest? I mean, cooperating with people will be within your self-interest. Building relationships will be within your self-interest. Having people like, respect, and trust you is, it, is within your self-interest. And those are selfish things. You have something you want, but you can't get it by yourself. So you cooperate with people and, you know, but what if what if you use people? That's within your self-interest, isn't it? Well, I'll I'll get on to that. Cooperating with people and building trusting relationships to have people like you and respect you is within your self-interest. Acquiring resources to prolong life and nourish your body, protecting your health is within your self-interest. You need resources, you need nourishment so you can keep living. Prolonging your life is within your self-interest. Keeping yourself healthy is within your self-interest. And building wealth is also within your self-interest. Because with wealth, it makes things easier. It makes... Wealth is your investment in your life and how long it takes you to acquire uh, resources. So now, you know, I, I brought up the point, you know, using people is within your self-interest. You get what you want if you use people. Well, I disagree. I say betraying... You know, if you use somebody, or you throw somebody under the bus, you leave them behind because they're not worth it, or something like that, it's not within your self-interest because you are betraying people. You are earning genuine dislike. You are lying. You are cheating. You are being rude. And none of that helps you. In the short term, it might help you because you're out of food, so you steal from somebody, they now hate you, but you were able to nourish yourself for one day. 
for one day. But guess what? They do not like you anymore. So your long-term relationship is punished. You were thinking short-term. You were not thinking long-term, which is why using people, which is why betraying people, which is why exploiting people is not within your self-interest because it harms your ability to prolong your life. It harms your health. It harms your ability to seek a healthful, desirable life that renders the struggles of life in a manner that is culpable, that, that, that is to the point where you can happily pursue your interests. Stealing resources is not within your self-interests. It puts you at risk. It puts your life at risk. It puts your property at risk. It puts your ability to free speech at risk. Because nobody will take you seriously. It puts your you as an individual at risk. And you really are an individual without a means of teamwork because nobody trusts you. We need to understand the relationship between actions and consequences. Therefore, using somebody is not within your self-interest. All right, let's move on. Uh, now that we talked about the principles of liberty, what I really, really think are the principles of liberty and are extremely important for anybody out there who wants to advocate libertarian ideas or anything related to liberty, those are my principles of liberty that I feel are so important. A zoo offering visitors buckets of Detroit zoo poo. Yeah, that's a thing. I added this news story to make the show a little funny. Some jokes write themselves. I can't write jokes about this. I mean, they're giving out buckets of zoo poo. There, there's a good reason why. You can read the article. It'll be in the description box below. They're basically recycling it. They generally recycle it to, uh, for energy, but they have so much of it that they won't be able to use it in time for it to be useful for energy. So they're offering it to the public so they can use it as compost and other useful things like that. They're recycling. Next thing on the list of recyclable items in Detroit is used needles. We're going green. That was a terrible, that was, that was terrible, I'm sorry. So, well, I'm not able to get to the last story. Not enough time. I was going to talk about courts and more government power related stuff, authority related stuff, but I'm not able to get to it. That's fine. Uh, this is a long episode. I talked a lot. I think you guys know how I feel about you know, quote unquote, assault weapons bans. You know how I feel about liberty. You know how I feel about government. You know how I feel about politics in general from this episode. I think I've said enough. I will save this story for episode five. I have it printed out ready. So yeah, I, I will save it for number five. Um, so let me just leave you with this. In life, there's going to be a number of struggles. You're going to come across an obstacle. And you are going to have decisions that you have to make. Sometimes you'll have to make them right away. Sometimes you'll have time to you know, sleep on it. Not everybody has the luxury of waiting. Some, some have that luxury. But something, if you can, something to ponder when you are making these decisions is to think about the long-term game, not the short-term game. If you're thinking short-term, you end up betraying people. And let's be honest, sometimes betraying somebody is a good thing. There is sometimes there are people that are holding you back. Therefore, you have to betray their trust and cut them out of your life. But that's for a long-term benefit. Sometimes. It sucks to do that. But I digress. That's not what I want to talk about. Life is a struggle. There's people out there who say there's no meaning to life whatsoever. These are generally non-religious people. Here's the thing is... Well, I think Christianity has been a net benefit to 
to the world. Uh, not not Christianity in the sense of the way Europe used Christianity, although I would say Europe is far superior to some places. I think secular Christianity is preferable. It's been one of the greatest things that the world has ever had to offer. I think the United States is a great example of secular-minded people taking Christian values and expanding upon it, and that's what I call the Enlightenment. Basically, you, you need to find a way, as I touched on it earlier in this episode, to prolong your life in a way that renders the struggles of life, because you're a vulnerable person, you need to find a way to live a perfect divide between chaos and order. Because if you're living a life of nothing but order, you're not living at all. And if you're living a life of nothing but chaos, like you're so open to the point where you don't really have any goals, you just kind of do stuff or you just plan on doing stuff, but you have no structure in your life, that's not really a way to live at all either. You need to find a balance. You need structural order. You need something that you can fall back on. You need consistency in your life. But at the same time, you need to do something to experience stuff. Especially if you're in a relationship or you're married. I've been dating the same girl for over four years now. As, as you know, the first couple years are pretty great. You know, you have the butterflies, and then the butterflies are kind of, eh, now we're in this together. The honeymoon stage is over. You don't want to just sit around and do nothing. I mean, you can. You know, you're safe that way. But your wife not might, you might not be happy. Your husband might not be happy. So you need to do something together that's interesting. And that's basically the principle that I'm talking about. You have structure. You have order. So your structure is a job, right? In this example, your structure is a job that you have that fulfills basically your, your basic needs. Shelter, food, and health, and self-defense. Basically, all of those are covered. And you know that's covered almost every day. But you need to open your mind, not necessarily, you don't need to open your mind, you just need to open yourself up, self up to experience new things. Maybe once a month you decide that you are going to go to a different restaurant every day. Maybe you're going to see a movie once a month. Maybe you're going to leave town once a month. Maybe you're going to go to a new store once a month. Maybe you're going to go to a concert once a month. Big concert, small concert. Maybe in January, you're going to go see a basketball game. Maybe in February, you're going to go to a concert. Maybe in March, you're going to go shopping. You're going to go to a mall. Maybe in April, you're going to get a girlfriend or you're going to go on a date with your girlfriend. Just you and her at a dinner, at a place that you both like. Maybe maybe the next month you're going to go go out and see a movie. Maybe the month after that you're going to see another sporting event. Maybe the month after that you're going to go out of town. Maybe the month after that you're going to rent a hotel so you two can be alone. Whatever. Maybe after that you guys are going to make a beautiful dessert or buffet together. Maybe after that you both are going to take dance classes. Just one dance class. Maybe you're going to take her to a dance. Maybe after that you're going to open up a book and you're going to finish that book within a month. Maybe, you're, maybe you and your spouse are going to read a book together. Or separate books and then exchange books. And it doesn't even have to be with your, with your wife. Maybe with your buddies. One month you guys want to go out and, and hit up the ladies. Maybe the next month you want to go out with your buddies. And instead of just hitting on the ladies, you guys are just hanging out, having some drinks, talking. Maybe you're going to go camping one month. <clears throat> Maybe you're just going to have a fire in your backyard one month and roast some marshmallows. Maybe you're going to crack open a bottle of wine and drink it with your, your spouse. 
Maybe you're going to crack, crack open a cold one with your buddies. You don't have to go anywhere fancy. You can open yourself up to experience without breaking the bank. Do things. Maybe you go to a museum. Maybe you put a list, put a list out of things that you want to do and you do one of them every month. You break away from that order and throw yourself into a little bit of chaos, but you have order to go back to. That is the perfect yin and yang. That is a perfect balance. You just have to find it for yourself. Open yourself up for experience. Because as an individual, you will grow. You are free, so express yourself in a free world. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of Logan for Liberty. I will see you guys next week. Have a good one.